47 counties and even beyond outside Africa. Now, Robert Banda, climate advocate, policy and governance, Nyongeso Michael. He is a carbon markets expert and a lucky bang. Climate justice experts are my guests in studio today as we have discussions around UNEA 6 that is taking place in Nairobi today. Also, just conversations around climate change, what is needed to do. Uh, also, just making sure that these big conversations, high level conversations, trickle down to the common man. And I'll start with you, Robert. Uh, Robert, uh, you come from the coast region, and when we talk about these meetings that keep happening, talk about Africa Climate Summit. We talk about COP28 uh, and now there is uh, the UNEA that is happening in Nairobi. Just what's the significance of these meetings? For me, um, first of all, thank you for uh, this platform. Um, I'm very grateful. Um, for me, I think despite all these meetings, these agreements, the environment is degrading. Because we've been having this meeting ever. They're there from UNEA 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, now 6. But what, is there anything tangible that has come up that has been implemented so far? This year, we are look at UNEA 6, we are looking at um, uh, the pollution, we are looking at the plastic. Um, are they going to come up with a, a policy that all African countries are going to come together, all the 193 countries are going to come together and in unison and say, this is the way we are going? So I feel, there is a lot of politics in it. Uh, every country wants to have its own bit. And uh, it's a matter of time. Okay. Well, time will tell, because at the end of the day, they are there. How, how many planes have been, uh, uh, have been boarded to just come for this conference? Mm -hmm. Yeah? You can imagine how many emissions that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So I, I feel th there is a lot that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a matter of time. We sit together and countries come and, and make issues, agenda, um, agenda forums or agenda meetings that this is what we are driving as, um, as the assembly. This is what we are driving and every country needs to adhere by this. Mm -hmm. Because without that then, what is the purpose of all this, the money that is being wasted? In this and I talked to you in Yongesa now, he's mentioned something to do uh, to Touch, to touch on pollution. And pollution is actually one of the big conversations at UNEA 6 as we speak at the moment because there is this entire conversation on just transition, getting out of fossil fuels and going green. As we have these discussions, it was the same conversation at Africa Climate Summit, same conversations at COP27 and all the other COPs, including COP28. It is the very same big conversations at UNEA 6. Therefore, what must we do for all these conversations, for all these agreements to finally start seeing actions on ground? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me again. Twice in two days, it's really, it shows that uh, you guys really care about the environment and you really want to pass the information across the community so that they can really understand what environment and what is happening in their own country, UNEA, which is a, a, a global meeting, though hosted each after every two years in Kenya means to the people of Kenya and even to the Africans and the globe. But there's a buzzword that has been introduced, has been in there for some time, but um, that has been introduced, uh, it's called the triple planetary threats. Mm -hmm. and that is uh, the issues to do with pollution, biodiversity, and climate change, the interlinkage. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can note one affects the other. Because when the climate changes, it affects, it, the cause may be pol some source of, pol of pollution, Pollution affects climate change. Climate change in the end results affects biodiversity. And it's very key to see that United Nations Environmental Assembly, the sixth, the sixth session, is really prioritizing issues of pollution. Because uh, we cannot overemphasize enough how Kenya, we've, we, especially Nairobi, we've been unable to deal with uh, the cleaning of our Nairobi ri river. You, you step at, out, the Kenya banned plastic, but you go, to, you go today to buy vegetables, there, especially from the informal settlements, you'll be wrapped in a plastic bag. So I know, I know when we say this, the government, especially National Environment Management Authority, try to tighten the best, but we still have poor responders. So what I'll say, I am glad to see an environmental assembly that is the highest decision-making organ, 193 members coming together to unite and say, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. if, even if it's a song, 
Remember, we used to sing about people just were celebrating the issues of loss and damage decision when we achieved it here at COP28. But what they don't know is that this issue, people have been singing it from COP, like COP17 in, in, uh, in Durban all through. People have been talking about loss and damage, loss and damage, loss and damage. So let's continue talking about pollution. One time we'll have a crack at it. One day we'll get it right. Now, Loki, yes. you are from Nigeria. Nigeria is a big country when it comes to oil production. Of course. As we talk about uh, energy transition now, that affects Nigeria and its economy. Now, when we're talking about just transition and stopping uh, the drilling and going green, how is this conversation settling down with uh, oil producers in Nigeria with regard to when you're telling us to drill, to stop drilling, what is the solution? What are we getting back in return? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Maseto. Uh, once again, I'm very grateful for the opportunity and I must commend your studio uh, because we are here for Unia 6 and one of the issues um, that has been on top of the agenda is um, the issue of youth inclusion. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this panel, I'm happy to see that um, <laughs> they're all young people. So uh, you guys have even gone ahead of Unia to implement some of the cries of young people. And, and I think that is commendable. Yes, just like you've mentioned, Nigeria, uh, we're very heavy and we're Nigeria is part of the um, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. Uh, we do have, um, in 2022, just a uh, few months before COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, we launched our energy transition plan. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at the entire document of the Nigerian energy transition plan, we will be needing um, roughly around $400 billion to transition um, up to 20, 2060. But um, the government of Nigeria have said that uh, we are going to rely on our huge uh, fossil fuel that we have uh, using gas as a transition fuel um, for our green uh, agenda that we have. So the, the conversation around just transition, Nigeria is, is, is part of it. It's not like uh, we are rebelling against that, but we are saying that uh, we have to transition at our own pace. That is one point the government of Nigeria is putting. And we currently, uh, I must commend the government of Nigeria, currently putting effort frameworks in place that would support that transition. Uh, we are yet to operationalize our energy transition plan. You still need to do some validation and then bringing in the voices of civil society into it. Uh, but there are challenges. Uh, we must say there are, there are challenges challenges of uh, finance, finance to transition uh, from what we have in the transition plan, we would need $10 billion annually to transition. Where that money is going to come from, heavily from the private sector. And it is high time we start to look at how to bring in the private sector into these conversations. Mm -hmm. And just before UNIA, um, I'm aware the government of Nigeria had convened um, a private sector stakeholders meeting to bring in the private sector into some of this conversation, including their role mm -hmm. in um, exploring the options that we have in Article 6.2, 6.4 that we have um, in the Paris Agreement. And I think um, um, we're doing good, but let's see what UNIA um, would, would come up with and then we run with that. Thank you. I like that. Now, Robert, now uh, let's talk about the position of Africa in all these conversations. For a very long time you find uh, the conversation out there is Africa has the resources mm -hmm. that the global uh, north has used for a very long time to grow their economies. The same resources that we have we are being told not to explore. Therefore, <laughs> what conversations should people have honestly on the table for us to say Unia 6 is addressing this with us, with those that drilled before, uh, ha, uh, also giving concessions on how to move forward. Uh, I think Africa needs to come, um, to come together. Mm -hmm. They leverage on what they have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, African countries need to have one voice, and uh, African countries need to work together in terms of um, uh, whatever decision that is being made. They need to s come together as a, as, a, as, a, as a continent and move with what they feel is right for them. Mm -hmm. 
rightful for them. Why am I saying this? Um, we are not leveraging on what we have because every African country wants to do something on, on, on their own. And uh, they fear probably eco in uh, the economic aspect of it that they are going to lose this or the other country is going to gain on this. I wish that is not there because we don't, we don't want to leave any African country behind. We need all these African countries to have one voice so that they can push and pressure such conferences that are going on or, or the, uh, the assembly that is going on so that they can be heard. But if African countries cannot come together and leverage on what they have, the resources they have, and bring everything together, the negotiators who are there need to come together and whatever idea they are there, they need to have an agreement so that when they, when they table it, it can be, it, it has everybody in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the biggest uh, thing that African countries are not having. And that is why we're having all these issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, Nyongesa, as he talks about yeah. Africans mm -hmm. and the need of Africa to come together to have this conversation, but we have the Africa Climate Summit mm -hmm. that came to Nairobi and mm -hmm. we had the Nairobi Declaration, which formed the basis upon which Africa as a continent was going to negotiate mm -hmm. at COP28. And now with this uh, document that we had as Africa and even the push and negotiation that finally brought together the loss and uh, damage conversation and even decisions on that, um, even with these documents, do we still have a seat at the table? <laughs> or is it just another document out there? Dennis, you're asking the right questions. And I'm <laughs> so happy. To be honest, because uh, first of all, le le let me just add on, on, on what Kelly said. Africa, we are now finding huge deposits of mineral resources, natural resources. And we are being told not to utilize because they, they pollute the environment or they contribute to climate change. And you see the question that I have for my fellow climate activists. You want President Ruto to deliver on their mandate, to give you quality education, quality health care and everything. Where do you want them to get the money? That's one. And uh, I, I'm speaking as a climate change person. That, that, that doesn't mean that I've sold to the other side. But I'm just saying the developed countries, for them to develop at that, to be at that level, they have uh, utilized their resources effectively. And I know the fear is that uh, the corruption and everything in Africa, the resources may not be utilized properly. But there are countries that are doing so well. Just the other day we found that uh, Botswana re re renegotiated their, their mining agreements with the, with, the, with the diamond companies. And they said, you either give us 50% or don't mine. And they are willing to, because these guys threatened that they are, we are going to leave, we are going to ex exit the negotiation table, and they were, they were like, go. That is the kind of leadership that we need for this continent so that these people can start respecting us. Anyway, coming back to your question about uh, if Africa is uh, at the table. Africa has always been at the table, but at least, but we speak with different voices. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. There's a reason why AU is not as strong as it is and EU is as strong as it is. The reason is all the 28 or rather 27 member states of the EU have ceded their power. Whatever decision that AU negotiates, EU, I mean European Union negotiates, is binding you can be held accountable as a member, Sweden can be held accountable, Belgium can be held accountable, France, Germany, all those countries can be held accountable by the decision. So when EU says we are going to cut our emissions by 60%, that's ambitious, I know. All the other countries are supposed to implement measures on how they're going to achieve that. But for African Union, countries have not ceded their powers to EU. So you, you, you find that AU is negotiating, but it's negotiating with both hands tied at the back. So it cannot really, really push for a collective agreement. When it comes to reaching an agreement, countries disintegrate to their colonial masters. Where, where by now, and that's why when you go to COP on these senior meetings, even here at UNEA, there are meeting rooms called bilateral zones, whereby if there's a lot of disagreements, they call Kenya side, and you know our colonial master was Britain. If Britain wants something to happen, even if the CS of environment it knows very well that this thing is not good for Kenya, but the prime minister calls President Ruto and says, I want this. The orders will come from above, and uh, they have to cede some to middle ground. So what I'm saying is that uh, Africa has the potential. We've seen as because uh, also not to criticize my country, but to say there's a time where Kenya refused to sign um, uh, um, an agreement in, uh, in Glasgow for, at, at COP26 because it was not good for Kenya. Okay. And I like that because president, the, the third president supported his, his CS then, Kariakotobiko, to make this decision. Okay. 
And you see, when you have leaders with spine, then Africa really can make something. But uh, the only thing that I can say where we miss out is the collectiveness of the AU vis-a-vis -vis the AU. You go to countries like uh, China alone, the population is the entire continent. Mm -hmm. So even if it makes a decision alone as a country, the way it affects the 1.4 billion people in China, it's the same as it's going to affect. The only difference is there are a lot of resources here and we need strong leaders to make a decision. And how do you make that decision? Mm -hmm. By the 54 countries, 55 countries in the AU, mm -hmm. in, in the AU purview to make a collective agreement. Just, just I, maybe <coughs> just to add uh, Aketa on, on, the, on, on what Michael is saying. Uh, the same thing Mike has just put across is something that happened in uh, Sharm El Sheikh when negotiators were in a room and uh, they were really hard on the, on the table. But uh, a call came from South Africa, let me say. They called the negotiator and said, no, please, come down. Mm -hmm. I think we'll go with that way. And he came out of, you know, he, he bulged out of the room and he started screaming, like, where are we going as African countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it's, it's a big, it's a big issue, uh -huh. and and uh, we are not, we are not um, having a unison voice, voice. as an African uh, country, and that is why everybody has is everybody is deserted. Everybody is doing his own things, and that is why you find our colonies will always take over. Lucky, yes, they say that we need all to unite in this fight uh, on climate change, but there is one conference that brings the entire world, all the continents together. That is the conference of parties. We're going to COP28. Is it about time that when you go to these uh, COPs, decisions that are arrived at are legally binding? Because if you go to <laughs> EU, those decisions in EU are legally binding. Yes. Is it about time that finally a text is put in those documents <laughs> that decisions made here are legally binding? Well, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we have had conversations and following in the last five years, there have been that increase mm -hmm. called for climate justice. And um, when you discuss with young people, having interactions with those who have gone ahead and then young people ask questions and then they come and say, ah, you know, these things are not legally binding. These are voluntary, mm -hmm. you know, countries are not, uh, on their own obligation. Mm -hmm. But I, I think to, to, to take us back a bit, Africa has really been, been, been doing good. The loss mm -hmm. and damage was, we are celebrating today mm -hmm. it started from COP27 in mm -hmm. Sharm Sheikh. It was pushed by Africans. Mm -hmm. um, the, the essence of climate action you can see is being driven by Africa, even though we emit probably less than 5%. Mm -hmm. uh, but to the question, if it is time, it's long overdue. Mm -hmm. But of course, they will bring you back to tell you that there's a process mm -hmm. to go through. <laughs> and that is where you have. And, and I'm happy because for, for UNIA, what is very strong on the table is the issue of ensuring that multilateral diplomacy delivers. Um, we've had five um, sessions, and this is the sixth session. Mm -hmm. Over 90 resolutions have been passed since the first UNIA up to this point. But because of that lack of legal binding status, so you just pass resolutions and when you come back to do an m and &E of how these resolutions and decisions are fair, you would hardly find any impact. It is time, but I think this is where we now need to, I don't know if it is right time for Africa to push that, uh, mm -hmm. that it becomes legally binding, but it's, it's a conversation that I think we can no longer shy mm -hmm. away from. Mm -hmm. We can shy away from it. And I think the necessary process and the necessary bodies would be able to do that. But this is where civil society as well come, come mm -hmm. to play, because most of the times the conversation of civil society and their impact calling out these issues as they are, mm -hmm. and not using uh, diplomatic words to paint them. Mm -hmm. uh, they need more support and more access to this decision-making body to mm -hmm. see that we ensure that somehow we find a way to get uh, the UN court, uh, International Court of Justice, and whatever court you have mm -hmm. to make this um, uh, conversation can legally I, binding. Can, can I just uh, well, let's, let's take this short conversation yes. break. When we come back, we continue the conversation. I'll come back to you to add on what Loki yes. was saying. But now let's take a short commercial.